Sir Michael Philip Jagger, known by his stage name of Mick Jagger, is best known for his role as the lead vocalist and founder of the Rolling Stones. He is an English musician, singer, and songwriter whose career has spanned over 50 years. He has been described by AllMusic as one of the most popular and influential frontmen in the history of rock and roll. His personal life has been one of scandal and intrigue, with his admitted use of drugs and his varied romantic life. Join us to learn more about one of the most influential and controversial musicians of our time. Jagger was born in Dartford, England, to his father, Basil Fanshaw Joe Jagger, and his mother, Eva Ensley Mary Jagger, on July 26, 1943. Both his father and his grandfather, David Ernest Jagger, were teachers. His mother was a hairdresser. He grew up in a middle-class family and was the eldest of two boys. His father raised Jagger to follow in his footsteps and become a teacher. Jagger was quoted in the book, according to the Rolling Stones, I was always a singer. I always sang as a child. I was one of those kids who just liked to sing. Some kids sing in choirs. Others like to show off in front of the mirror. I was in the church choir, and I also loved listening to the singers on the radio, the BBC, or Radio Luxembourg or watching them on TV and in the movies. Michael Philip Jagger was born in 1943 in um, Dartford, Kent, England. And he is the lead singer for Rolling Stones. He grew up in a very conservative background and his mother, Eva, she talks about how her um, how appalled she was that her two beautiful sons, Mick and Chris, were, um, she'd hear them singing to um, Chuck Berry and um, rhythm and blues records <laughs> while they were climbing trees. And um, Mick met Keith in primary school when they were about five. You'll hear different. Um, reports about what age they were from like four or seven or but at about five and then they lost touch with each other mm -hmm. until um, they were teenagers mm -hmm. and um, Keith noticed that Mick had a couple of rhythm and blues albums with him they met on the um, at a train depot and um, they got to talking again, and that's how they reconnected. Jagger became interested in American blues and R&B early in his life. At the age of 14, Jagger got his first guitar. During his teen years, Jagger would collect music from musicians like Little Richard, Muddy Waters, and Howlin' Wolf. Jagger would form a band called Little Boy Blue and the Blue Boys, with his friend Dick Taylor. Beginning in September 1950, Jagger, known as Mike then, would become classmates with Keith Richards at Wentworth Primary School in Dartford, Kent. In addition to being well-liked, Jagger would do well in school. Four years later, he would pass the 11 plus, which would allow him to attend Dartford Grammar School. The 11 plus was a test that was given to students at the end of their primary year to determine admission to a secondary school. Dartford Grammar School now has a Mick Jagger Center. During the time he attended Dartford, Jagger lost touch with Keith Richards as they were attending different schools. However, in 1960, a chance encounter put the boys back in touch with each other. They discovered each had a love of R&B and renewed their friendship. Well, they started, you know, he and Keith, you know, were, were doing a lot of blues-based stuff, you know, before they, uh, you know, kind of their mod, mod pop, and then they, they delved into some blues before the psychedelia, you know, when they were competing with the Beatles and whatnot in the late 60s. Of 
basically Mick was involved in the church choir. He did a lot of singing, um, and uh, that's how he got into his music, was the church choir. They started in 1962 um, when they met Brian Jones. Um, and the first club they played was the Marquee Club. And um, that's how it all started. Um, Brian Jones is the one who, um, who actually started the band. And um, their first album was The Rolling Stones. And I believe it came out in 1965. In 1961, Jagger moved into a flat with Keith Richards and Edith Grove in Chelsea. He and Richards had been spending time checking out London's new blues scene. They ended up spending time at a club called the Ealing Club. While at the club, the two heard a group called Alexis Corners Blues Incorporated. They were amazed with a guitarist who would make special appearances with the group. His name was Brian Jones. He would end up moving in with Richards and Jagger. Jagger would also eventually end up doing guest vocals with Blues Incorporated. Jones and Richards worked on plans to begin their own R&B group. During this time, Jagger continued with business courses at the London School of Economics as he was contemplating a career in journalism or politics. Eventually, Jagger, Richards, Taylor, and Jones would soon start their own band that would eventually become the Rolling Stones. You know, they started out as a blues-based band, you know. You know, it's a lot of American... Blues-based was their influences, Muddy Waters, you know, uh, Robert Johnson, a lot of the greats, you know. That was their, their, their vibe at first, was blues-based rock. Well, you know, they had sex appeal and great riffs, and uh, they just had a way of putting it all together. They had a formula, you know, like it was just their style. You, you couldn't contest that. It's beautiful. The Rolling Stones got to be as big as they are because there was no one like Mick Jagger. He was he wasn't um, particularly good looking. He, um, he was made fun of at the time for his big lips and his acne and um, the way he danced and Nobody had ever seen anything like him, and he's always um, he's always been a trailblazer, I believe. You know, from one decade to the next, you know, the Stones were all, always pushing the envelope and introducing um, things that had been um, not talked about before. Like, um, uh, you know, there, here were some white boys. You know, there was this white boy, and he was sound he sounded black. Mm. And he, and um, they, Mick um, brought androgyny to the surface, and um, he he wasn't afraid to do these things, and he didn't care what anybody said. He he just did it, and I believe um, that's what has made them trailblazers. Uh, Mick was a bit crazy, and he, he wanted to be different. Uh, his persona was just very, very energetic. Um, he was out there to get the attention of the public. His, his, main, his main thought was he wanted to, to stand out amongst the other bands that were out at the time. Um, he loved his music. Uh, and it was a part of him being that he, he started in church choir since he was a child. It was, it was a part of his personality. And uh, he loved it and didn't want to do anything else. By 1963, the band was becoming more popular. Opinion polls conducted in 1964 rated the Rolling Stones as England's most popular group. They even topped the Beatles in popularity in the polls. An important ingredient in their growing popularity was Mick Jagger, with his crazy stage performances and his sex appeal. The Rolling Stones were being marketed by their manager, Andrew Lug Oldman, as wild and rough rockers. 
This style attracted the attention of Decca Records, who signed a deal with the Rolling Stones. Jagger would leave the London School of Economics to devote more time to the ever-increasingly popular band. It also had the effect of cementing their image as rowdy, troublemaking rock and rollers, in direct contrast to the boy next door image the Beatles projected. Some say they're a little dirty or a little raw, but I can beg the different. They were very sweet as well and beautiful melodies, and like the Beatles did. And uh, they were very harmonious as well, but uh, they were like the Beatles in ways they were very prolific, you know, and they had many different styles as far as blues, psychedelia, and pop songs that they could write. So um, it, was, it was an amazing force, all those elements together. The Rolling Stones at the time um, were a lot raunchier, and um, it, it's like the good kids, the cleaner kids like the Beatles, mm -hmm. but the real rebels like the Stones. Um, the, the kids who liked the Stones were more foul-mouthed and would tease their hair more and wore more makeup, and um, so that's where the difference lies between the two. <laughs> you know, they had a, a, a scruffy basement, you know, they had a dirty appeal to them, image-wise, you know what I mean? Um, they went against what, you know, the, the that image of what the Beatles had. And I don't think they intended to do it, it just kind of happened. You know what I mean? They, honestly, I think they wanted to separate themselves from the Beatles, but you don't necessarily, you know, I, I would think with musicians they separate themselves based off of sound. We choose to play this, we choose to sing this, we choose to do it this way. Um, but you know, the, the public has a different opinion on what's different, so. Uh, the Rolling Stones compared to the they were prototypes, but th yet they were rivals against the Beatles. Their music was totally different. Um, it was a bit wild and crazy, um, a little bit threatening, where the Beatles was a little bit more mellow type of music. In spite of the success of the albums, the reputation and behavior of the band members almost landed them in jail. Apparently, in the Sunday, February 5th, 1967 edition of The News of the World, a story was published stating that Mick Jagger, among others, used LSD. He appeared that same day on the Eamon Andrews show, stating that he never used LSD and that he would be suing the paper. During a police raid of Keith Richards' country home, Jagger, Marianne Faithful, Jagger's girlfriend, and Richards were among those arrested. Given that the police actually had a search warrant, there was suspicion of a tip-off. When the News of the World announced details of the raid prior to the police announcement being made, their suspicions were confirmed. Apparently, the paper did not like receiving the writ for libel from the group and wanted some revenge. The paper played up the outrageous behavior and clothing of the group during the raid. Richards and Jagger were given unduly severe punishments. Jagger had been sentenced to three months in jail for possession of over-the-counter pet pills, amphetamine tablets, that had been purchased in Italy. Richards received a year's sentence for allowing marijuana to be smoked on his property. Both were immediately imprisoned, but released the next day on bail until their appeal was heard. In the late 1960s, um, Mick was arrested um, for drug possession, um, amphetamine tablets, and um, there was a huge raid at Redlands, which was Keith Richards' house mm -hmm. at the time. And um, at that time, Brian Jones, the founder of the Stones, had also been um, getting busted. But uh, Mick was actually jailed for a short time, and um, the judge wanted to make an example out of these long-haired, wild rock stars. Mm -hmm. And um, an article came out in the newspaper, I believe it was the News of the World, um, saying who crushes a butterfly on a wheel or something and um, which had a, which garnered a lot of sympathy for Mick and Keith and so they were able to get out of prison earlier. 
Mick, Mick Jagger was arrested in, in, in during that time for over-the-counter drugs. And because of the image he had, they arrested him for being a drug dealer. But the drugs that he had were over-the-counter medication. Okay. So uh, it goes to show that, you know, uh, I guess that old saying, if it looks like a duck, walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it must be a duck, right? Sure. If he looks like a drug dealer and dresses like a drug dealer, then he must be a drug dealer or, <laughs> you know what I mean, or a drug user. So they, they locked him up for it. The band was once again embroiled in trouble a few months later that was not of their own making. During the promotion of their album, Let It Bleed, the Rolling Stones gave a free performance at Altamont Speedway in Northern California. During the song, Under My Thumb, a young man stabbing death at the hands of the Hell's Kitchen motorcycle gang was caught on tape and was eventually featured in a documentary called Gimme Shelter. It was later revealed in 2008 that this incident had made Jagger a target for the Hells Angels, and they had tried to have him murdered in 1969. The BBC documentary has a former FBI agent explaining exactly how Jagger became a target of the group. Apparently, they had been hired as security for the concert and were to keep trouble from occurring. When this did not happen, Jagger was furious and blamed the Hells Angels. They in turn were so upset over how he treated them that the group decided to target him at his home in the Hamptons. The attack did not succeed because of bad weather and their boat almost sank. The story of um, that festival they played, uh, Live at Altima, um, it was a tragic, unfortunate series of events. You know, a young black man was killed by the Hells Angels, brutally beaten, stabbed in the front row there. You know, Mick tried to defuse the situation, you know, peace, not violence. But, you know, that was a wild weekend going on. You know, they got flown in the helicopters and flown out, and <clears throat> the Hells Angels really started destroying a lot of stuff, and that was the last time I, I believe they were used as security for the Rolling Stones. But that was a, um, a tragic event in rock and roll history. Gimme Shelter was a song um, by the Stones, but it was also a documentary that, um, was about the um, the free concert they gave at the Altamont mm -hmm. Speedway, and um, it was a free concert. Um, the Hell's Angels were security, and in exchange for beer, um, there's some um, some stories saying that um, no, the angels were actually paid, and um, beer was. Uh, it wasn't their pay, um, but um, uh, they wound up killing a young man, and um, it said it was racially motivated because he was um, he was black, Meredith Hunter, um, that was his name, and he was there with a white woman, blonde girl, and. Um, he got into it with one of the angels and um, he pulled out a gun and um, he was stabbed to death. It's interesting when you when you see when you watch the footage of when the murder is happening it's happening right in front of the stage while Mick, Mick and the, the Stones are performing and um, Mick uh, keeps going. Um, it's like um, he he doesn't really want to acknowledge it. It's it's almost like if, um, if he ignores it, it'll go away. But at some point he notices and um, he stops. And um, there's pictures of him standing there just aghast, you know, watching this poor kid die right in front of him. And um, I think it was shocking for everyone, for everyone, because um, everyone was just, they were so out of control by that point. And um, uh, supposedly the Hells Angels put a contract out on Mick, but I, I don't know how much validity there is to that. 
Jagger produced and guest starred in the first episode of The Knights of Prosperity, aired for a brief time in 2007. Jagger continued to tour and release albums with the Rolling Stones while beginning a solo career. He has created six solo albums beginning in 1985. She's the Boss was his first album, and it was certified silver in the United Kingdom and platinum in the United States. His second album, Primitive Cool, did not reach the commercial success of his first album, even though it was well-received critically. The third album, Wandering Spirit, became certified platinum in the United States. He received a silver certification for his fourth album, Goddess in the Doorway, in the United Kingdom. A few of Mick Jagger's solo stuff, like I've heard most of it actually. Um, I think it's just as great as any of the other stuff. I mean, it's Mick Jagger, it's his voice. He carries the stones. I mean, obviously, Keith Richards and Charlie Watts and, you know, Bill Wyman, all of them had a lot to do with it, but Mick's voice is ultimately what people can relate to the stones with, you know? I mean, if you look at Keith Richards' solo stuff and Mick Jagger's solo stuff, it's roughly the same kind of material, same vibe, you know? It's just Keith singing it and Mick singing it, you know? But they come from the same cloth. So uh, I, I really enjoy um, Mick Jagger's solo stuff just as much as his work with the Stones. Mick was in a couple of movies um, in the 60s, Performance and Ned Kelly. And um, Mick and Keith had always had a stormy relationship. Mm -hmm. And as time went on, you know, into the 80s, um, they just couldn't seem to get along. Um, well, it, I think it basically started when Mick was entering his androgynous period and um, taking so much time to put makeup on his face and because he wanted it to look good under the lights. And Keith and the other Stones just wanted to play the music, play rock and roll. And um, so, um, so that caused more of a rift between them. And um, that's and then Mick started to go solo um, with "She's the Boss." That was his first album, and later on came "Primitive Cool." Um, but he never reached um, the level of success on his own as he did with the Stones. Well, Mick Jagger and the Rolling Stones. It shows that they need each other when you start talking about his solo career. He could have. Could he do it by himself? Yes, he did it. One album. Great. Could he continue by himself? Mm, I think he would have faded out because that second album wasn't that good compared to the first one. You know? Does that mean he could have rebound by his third album? We never know. We don't know. Because, I, I, you know, when you go back on tour with the Rolling Stones, the Rolling Stones are, it, it, it's a happy marriage. You know what I mean? Sometimes some artists are better by themselves. Michael Jackson was a better solo performer than he was when he was with the Jackson 5. However, would we have known Michael Jackson without the Jackson 5? Probably not. Would we have given him the same shot? Probably not. Would we have given Mick Jagger the same shot? Probably not. You know what I mean? But, you know, you need one. one I, I don't think one would exist without the other. You know, I, I think he was great, but, you know, that the Rolling Stones solidify his greatness. Jagger and Richards have had a tumultuous friendship over the years. Richards once stated that, I think our differences as a family squabble. If I shout and scream at him, it's because no one else has the guts to do it or else they're paid not to do it. At the same time, I'd hope Mick realizes that I'm a friend who is just trying to bring him in the line and do what needs to be done. Their friendship has been described by the media as a love-hate relationship. Um, Mick Jagger's relationship with Keith Richards, they are like family. You know, they've known each other since elementary school. You don't always love your family. You don't always like your family, but you love them, you know? And when y'all are good, things are really good. When y'all fight, you really fight and I think that's the best way to explain a friendship that they have I don't 
you know, a, a lot of people may say it's, you know, a love-hate relationship, but, you know, I, I just think when they have a disagreement and they fight, they really get into it. And it's something that only them two can explain, you know what I mean? From the outside looking in, you know, I, I try and look at it in the sense of my brothers. Like, I love my brothers to death, but I don't always like them. Mm -hmm. And when we fight, we may say some mean things or it may get to a heated physical altercation. But at the end of the day, I love them and I'll do anything for them. And I think that's the way it is with them. Mick and Keith's relationship was um, based on chemistry, man. It's pure chemistry. You know, they got into a room together and they could come up with a song in 20 minutes, you know. And that's been the base of their formula for 50 years. You know, they're just prolific songwriters. So the two of them, um, it's a must, you know. It, was, it, was, it had to be. It was, it was meant to be. Jagger has been in the public eye because of his numerous high-profile relationships. In addition to being married twice, Jagger has also had numerous other affairs. He has even been linked to other male singers. He has been linked to numerous other women, including Chrissy Shrimpton, Marianne Faithful, Anita Pallenberg, Carly Simon, Angelina Jolie, and many others. To speak on uh, Mick Jagger's relationships, um, you know, Studio 54, Bianca, uh, Jerry Hall, and then you got, you know, all his beautiful love. He just got married, actually, here uh, to a beautiful woman. But um, he's a sex god, so who wouldn't want to be with him? So. <laughs> Can you blame the guy? <laughs> In the early 70s, Mick Jagger married um, Bianca Jagger, mm -hmm. um, who um, supposedly had been engaged to Michael Caine, um, and he met her at a party, and he was taken with how much she looked like him. And um, people had said, like, the, that's the reason why he liked her so much, because it was the closest he could get to making love to himself. <laughs> <laughs> and um, but that didn't uh, um, the marriage didn't work out they had one daughter um, but the marriage didn't work out and um, then he started seeing Jerry Hall and um, they it's it's put up to debate if they ever really got married or not she thought they were married and then he claimed that they that it wasn't a legal marriage after all, and um, but um, they wound up splitting up after having been together for quite some time. And um, I believe he has like six children wow. by several different women, and um, and he has a daughter with Marsha Hunt. Mm -hmm. and who's Marsha Hunt? Marsha Hunt was a singer and an actress. She was in um, the musical Hair. Okay. And he has a daughter with her. Um, you know, I know he has a total of seven children, but I know he's been linked to a lot of females. <laughs> so, you know, rock and roll lifestyle, man. I'm, if you're blessed enough to live that life before you settle down, you know, my hat's off to you because to be able to choose the type of woman you're with and to have them all throwing themselves at you. I would call that a good life. Jagger and Richards cultivated the image of the Rolling Stones as anti-establishment. This ultimately led to their popularity with their fans and a lot of their legal problems. Jagger's performances have always been high energy, sexually charged, and combined with the provocative lyrics have made him a symbol of counterculture. His controversial love life and his drug usage have combined to enhance this image. In spite of all that, Jagger's influence on music and culture cannot be denied. As Christopher Anderson, a biographer, once said, Jagger is one of the dominant cultural figures of our time and is the story of a generation. You know, he's a living legend, and um, what more is there to say about Mick Jagger than he's still around, he's still kicking, still rocking, and uh, I see him continuing for as long as he possibly can. You know, at the time when they started, the Beatles started. The Beatles had the clean hair, haircuts and the clean clothes. They wore grungy stuff. 
their hair, they had the grungy hair and, and they looked like they needed a bath. You know what I mean? And at that time, people probably would have said, you know, it looks dirty. Why do you want to look dirty? But I mean, when you think of what grunge is today and what punk is today, he was at the front of that decades ago. You know what I mean? When you, when you start talking about the, the way bands do covers now and the way that they take from the Rolling Stones to create their sound, you know, it, it's, I think it's a testament of what his legend is, you know? You gotta be like for somebody to wanna follow in your footsteps. And I think he did, a, I, think, I think he'll forever be great. I would say his legacy has, is his sound, his looks, um, the way he danced. Mm -hmm. He didn't care if people thought he looked ridiculous. Um, he was a trailblazer. He, uh, if he wanted to wear makeup or a dress, he did. And it didn't matter to him that um, men weren't supposed to do that. And um, he pushed the envelope. And uh, he was one of the first people to do that. And I think that's what has always, um, that's been his legacy.